One that is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The God of creation, the superintendent of life, the giver of all good things. Father, we love you, we bless you, we honor you, and as we are now at this preaching and teaching occasion, we pray that you would indeed speak clearly. That you would give us our marching orders, give us encouragement, insight, and wisdom. Use me as your vessel. Forgive me of my sins, forgive me of all of my inadequacies. Let the new inside of me sit down. The new inside of me rise up. You go forward to live this message. In the mighty Matthew's name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning, this indeed is the day that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice and be glad in it. I just have one question. Is there anyone excited about being in God's house? Anybody? Amen. 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 We can be dead sleeping in our graves, but yet God gave us another chance to be here. For that we ought to be grateful. Amen. Amen. I want us to continue in our shamanic series. If you don't mind, turn with me to the book of Philippians, the fourth chapter. Started several weeks ago. This series entitled Don't Worry, Be Happy, the Sermonic Series. And we are continuing up with just a few more installments of this particular series. Man. I'd like for you to turn your attention to the book of Philippians, the fourth chapter. Of course, greeting our cyber community, for those who are watching by way of YouTube and Facebook, live and other social media outlets. There have been those who have been watching faithfully with great anticipation, um, amen, of, of what's going to be taught and preached uh, each week. So we thank them for their commitment. Of course, as always, if you are within the 50-mile radius, um, don't watch us live. Come join us live. Amen. 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 Come and be with us in, in fellowship and, uh, and enjoy this experience and, and see it consistent for yourself. But for those who are not able to make it because of distance, because of illness, and or because of work, we thank God for modern technology. Mark Zuckerberg had this in mind when he created Facebook Live. Uh, but we're going to use it, amen, for the kingdom. Hallelujah. <laughs> Philippians, the fourth chapter. Do you have it? If you do, say amen. 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 You still look and say, wait a minute. Amen. Be as though everyone is here. Why don't you stand up with your feet? If you would be so kind as we read this word of God in both my reading and in your hearing, we, of course, um, have dealt with several verses already. I want to put the sermonic spotlight, if you don't mind, on two verses in particular. While well, yet we will preach from the context of this particular chapter, uh, we are going to look at just verses 8 and 9, reading from the New King James Version. Here's how the word of God reads. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Finally, brethren, Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I want to use as a topic and a title for this particular installment, and don't worry, be happy, sermonic series, use this as our topic today. Peace be with you. Amen. You ought to turn to your neighbor and as you take your seat, you ought to do this. Say, neighbor, peace be with you. Amen. Peace be with you. You may have a seat in the presence of our Lord and our King. Peace be with you. If you recall, over the past several weeks, we have been 
dealing with this topic about how to attain peace. And of course, learn that peace is not the absence of chaos. We also learn that if we are going to strive to be happy, if you will, or to be at peace, then we need to learn uh, not to worry about anything. We need to learn to pray about everything. And we need to learn to give thanks and or to be thankful for and or in all things. Amen? Amen. That's what we are to do if we're going to attain peace. And in doing these things, the Bible tells us and Paul instructs us that uh, we will uh, attain peace and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding uh, will guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. And we learn that this peace that surpasses all understanding is a peace that will exceed and or excel our limits and or our understanding. It will blow our minds it will keep our mind, and it will calm our mind. Is that what I told you? Y'all remember? Y'all said no. Amen. It will do these things to our mind, and this is helping us to attain this peace. But today, Paul goes on in verse 8, and he says, finally, as he's bringing some conclusion to this, he says, finally, brethren, he says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, and he goes on this list of virtues, uh, and he tells us to uh, focus on those things. So if I could just package what we've learned so far as we transition to what we're going to learn today, I will simply just give it to you this way. Refuse to crumble, which basically means don't worry about anything. Rely on Christ, which means to pray about everything and refrain from complaining, which means to give thanks in all things. Should I give it to you once again? Yeah. First of all, we ought to refuse to crumble. Let the church say refuse to crumble. Yeah. If we're not going to worry about anything, we have made up in our minds that we refuse to crumble. We refuse to allow life circumstances, situations to allow, uh, to cause us to fall apart. And that's what happens really, my brothers and my sisters, in essence, is that life's trials and tribulations and troubles have a tendency to sometimes cause us to lose it, to lose control and to lose our minds and or to lose our focus. So we've got to make up in our minds if we're going to not worry and be happy, not be anxious about anything, not worry about anything. We have to refuse to crumble. We got to make up our mind. I'm not going to let nothing tear me apart and tear me down. I know life is hard. I know life is challenging. I know life can be overwhelming. And I know there are things in life that sometimes seem un um, insurmountable. Amen. It seems like we cannot overcome them. But my brothers and my sisters, when we have God on our side, watch this, and when we have God on the inside, then we know that there is nothing that we come against and or that comes against us that will defeat us. Bless you. I've got a witness in here on today. So, so I refuse. I refuse to crumble. I told you that worry is a self-induced, uh, is self-induced and self-inflicted. It is self-tormenting. You're tormenting yourself when you worry. So you now have to, if worrying then therefore is a choice, so is refusing to not worry and or refusing to not crumble. Mm -hmm. I choose to. Yes, this situation may be uh, somewhat intimidating, but I refuse to give in. And when you refuse to give in, you refuse to give up. You have a certain tenacity about you. You have a bulldog tenacity as to where you're going to move forward no matter what. There is no retreating, advance only. Are uh, y'all praying with me on today? So refuse to crumble means to don't worry about anything. Anything means anything. 
Pastor, what about that? Anything. Yeah. Well, Pastor, what about anything? Don't worry about anything. But not only will we refuse to crumble, we rely on Christ. To rely on Christ means I pray about everything. So if I'm choosing not to worry about anything, then I know that I must and I should pray about everything. There was not one thing that I don't pray about. I pray about everything. <clears throat> to always be in a prayerful mode, to always be in a prayerful mindset, to be a prayerful person is, is a person who does not make a move without making, uh, 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 giving consideration to what God's thoughts are and God's desires are in the situation. Praying about everything does not mean you have to always get down on your knee every second throughout the day and pray. But it is being in a prayerful state of mind. You are always, I'm always talking to God throughout the day. I am. We, we're just communicating back and, forth, or back and forth. And I ain't got to go close my eyes and go and get in the closet or lay prostrate uh, uh, or any of that. I'm, I'm, I'm always praying. And people ain't got to know you're praying. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. Um, so it's to pray about everything. God, what do you think about this? God, God, God how, how, how should I go about this? It's your choice on what you do. Right. God gives us the freedom of choice. He does not make our choices for us. Right. You all hear me? He doesn't make our choices for us. And I think some of us misconstrue when we get that thing all discombobulated and all messed up and what have you. So I'm going to give you my, 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 my understanding and my interpretation of scripture as it relates to about praying in, 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 in those things. Some people... You know, I get into a debate with folk, um, you know, about this that I'm about to introduce to you. But some people, you know, uh, may say, well, I'm, I'm praying, uh, you know, and I want God to tell me uh, who I'm supposed to marry. Choose my wife for me. Or choose my car. Choose my house. Choose this and choose that. And I just don't know that I'm convinced scripture instructs us to do it that way. I mean, maybe he may take objection, but I'm going to tell you why. If God, watch this, does not choose salvation for you, which is most important, he gives you the choice to choose him or to reject him. So if he doesn't choose Christ for you, then why is he going to choose what color your house ought to be? Pretty fast. <laughs> Why is he going to choose what car you ought to buy? Come on. Why is he going to choose what college you ought to go to or what job you ought to work? Or why is he going to choose who your spouse is? If he's not choosing salvation for you, which is most important, if he's not choosing Christ for you, which is most important, why does he make those choices for you? It's your choice who you marry. Amen. So look at your spouse. No, don't look at your spouse. <laughs> Whoever you with, you can't blame that on God. That's your choice. Amen. Uh, uh, you, you can't, uh, you know, when it comes to your car, come on, God's going to choose you ought to choose the blue one. <laughs> I just don't know. I just can't see that that's God's uh, method of operation. He gives us choice. Now, can God give us wisdom, give us guidance? Can we pray that God helps us to be at peace in our decisions and, and help steer us? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But when it comes to making the choice, if he's not choosing salvation for you, which is most important, then why choose those things? You can wrestle with that if you want to. If, if I get to heaven and, 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 and God tells me I was wrong, then it would have been my bad. But I can't see in Scripture otherwise. If he ain't choosing salvation, why choose what college you go to? God, is this a good fit for me? Yes, that's a good fit for you. Can God lead you and guide you and direct you? And because of where you end up, can God end up using you and, and there'll be great things that, and, and it'll be a part of destiny? Yes, I believe all that. God has certain things mapped out or what have you, and you choosing or going along a certain path, destiny may materialize, but, you know, but yet be prayerful about everything. God, give me wisdom, give me peace, give me calm about every decision that I make in life. Because I want to make certain I'm in your will. Amen. Amen. I don't want to just make decisions that are good decisions. I want to make godly decisions. So give me wisdom and give me insight. So yes, pray about everything, but know that God gives you 
choice. Amen. 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 So to rely on Christ means I'm relying on him. Listen, I can't do any of what I do unless Christ gives me strength, gives me power, gives me wisdom. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. I've been preaching this gospel for now 23, it'll be 24 years this year. Amen. And every time I get up in this pulpit, wherever I am preaching, I'm relying on Christ. It's not on the fact that I've done this with some degree of regularity. It's not the fact that I have some degree of confidence in my ability to speak and to communicate. It has nothing to do with my talent. I rely on Christ. If I got to pray it before people, I'm relying on Christ. If I got to read scripture, whatever my assignment is, I'm relying on Christ. I don't take it for granted. Amen. Amen. And that ought to be our disposition. That ought to be how we approach life, that we rely on him. Don't you ever get so comfortable and or become too confident in yourself that you, 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 you don't equate Christ into the equation. Amen. Christ is not in the equation. I rely on Christ. So refuse to crumble. Rely on Christ. Pray about everything. But refrain from complaining. Give thanks about it. all things. There is nothing in life that I'm not thankful for. Even the seemingly bad things in my life. Because if God allowed it, then God's going to use it. If God allowed it, there's somehow, some way that some good's going to come out of it. I may not like it, but there's some good that's going to come out of it. Mm -hmm. For those who take medicines when you're sick, if you take medicines in its most pure form, medicines don't taste too good. It can be bitter, it can be tart, it can be pretty nasty. So if you take naturals and, and, and stuff like that, some things that you know, that we take to, to strengthen our bodies that are not medicines per se, uh, but has, uh, uh, you know, medicinal purposes, you know, and certain um, leaves and all that stuff, or certain oils you take, and it may not, it, it does it does your body well, it helps you to heal, it helps you to, to, to get better and what have you, but when you take it in its most purest and um, strength and most purest form, it's not, it doesn't taste that good. But even though it doesn't taste that good, there's some good in it. My brothers and my sisters, I've discovered that life doesn't always taste good. I've discovered that throughout the course of life, there are some things that are not always that pleasant. Sometimes there are things that are quite painful. But even in, when there are things that are painful and things that are not that pleasant, God somehow uses it to bring about good in our lives. And so with that in mind, I've learned to be thankful about all things. Though I may not like all things, I'm thankful for all things. And so God... I don't want to be a person who is ungrateful. I don't want to be a person who is what my mama used to call us ingrates. I don't want to be that, Lord. I want to be a person that understands that there is beauty even in darkness. I, I want to be a person that understands, dear Lord, that somehow, some way, you have factored into the equation that even during my downfall, seemingly my downfall, that somehow, some way, is going to lead to my deliverance and lead to my destiny. Amen. Preach Pastor Sanders. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, when we approach life from this angle and from this perspective, then we are in a position to be at peace. Amen. Because to, to, we're refusing the word. Uh, we, we're not allowing life circumstances to beat us up and to bring us down. And we're prayerful about all things. And we're giving, thank, um, giving um, thanks in all things. And it is because of this and it is through this that the peace of God, which surpasses all, all understanding, will guard our hearts and will keep our minds. But Paul now says, finally, he says... I want you to, to give consideration to these virtues and these characteristics. So there's two simple points, and here it is, and I'm almost done. The first point is meditate on these things. Let the church say meditate on these things. Yeah. Meditate on these things. What things, Pastor? These things right here in verse 8. He says, first of all, whatever is true. Meditate on whatever is is true. True is accepting those things that are truthful in every aspect of our lives. It is including thought. It is including speech. And it is including act. So 
So what we think and what we speak and what we do. My brothers and my sisters, we have to understand that there are, uh, uh, that in, uh, th those things that are true and those things that are pure, it is in these things that we must meditate on. We must reflect upon. He says, if you want uh, to overcome worry and you want to have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, he says, factor in these things into your everyday life. Whatever is true, meditate on that. Whatever is true, whatever has, whatever is genuine, meditate on those things. He says, and in thought and in speech and in act. Let me give it to you this way real quick and then I'll move on to the next point. Watch. I tell people and I talk about this all the time. I've done it for years as a youth pastor, as a youth worker, as a youth advocate, juvenile justice advocate, and everywhere I go, I tell people and I talk to people about being mindful and protecting their ear gate and their eye gate. You gotta, you gotta be conscious of that. Protect your, your ear gate and your eye gate. And I promise you, I get into debate about it all the time because people don't take it seriously and they think it's just a bunch of hogwash and so on and so forth. But I tell people what you see, what you allow into your psyche by way of your sight. And what you allow into your psyche by way of your ears, by way of uh, uh, your auditory. Amen. It can influence and affect and impact and shape and mold your thought. So if you're watching filth and corrupt and, 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 and all that stuff, you know, for extended periods of time, you can't help by allowing that to go in through your eye gate or if you're listening to a bunch of garbage and filth. You can't help by allowing that to go into your ear gate. You can't help for it not to influence and impact because it's infiltrated your mind. Once it infiltrates your mind, it influences your mind. Once it influences your mind, it uh, impacts your mind. It impacts and influences your way of thinking. You've got to be careful of what you let in. And so it's not just uh, uh, thought, but speech. Because now, that something has become a part of the way you think. It can't help but to manifest and materialize through speech and or through action. That doesn't mean you're gonna do exactly what you saw or exactly what you heard. No, not necessarily. But it influences your thought psyche, your thought pattern, and it may manifest in some other way, some other form or fashion. Are y'all hearing me on today? He says so, Instead of meditating on things that are, uh, you know, filthy and corrupt and what have you, he says meditate on things that are pure because it will reflect, it infect, and it will impact, and it will influence, it will infiltrate your mind. But not only that, he says whatever is noble. Whatever is noble, that is that which is lofty and or majestic. That which lifts the mind from the cheap uh, uh, to that which is noble and good. Uh, my brothers and my sisters, it is healthy for believers to meditate on things that stretch us. Paul, in essence, is saying, take your thinking to a higher level. Some of us are not thinking high enough. We're not, we're, 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 some of us are living below and beneath our potential. And it's because we're not focusing on the right things. The other day, my best friend and I uh, decided to go to uh, go to the golf range. Uh, I'm, I'm not a golfer. I don't really too much care for golf, but I don't like golf. Uh, I understand that uh, many people enjoy it because it says it's, it's calming and all of the good stuff. Well, I didn't find it to be all that calming. Amen. I took lessons, and I, if I can say this, I sucked at it. I was terrible. Amen. I wanted my money back. I did. I was. I was not good in the lessons uh, in playing golf, even though I took lessons and just never had an interest in it. But he said, "Hey, man, let's go. No problem. Fine, let's go." And we went. And he was teaching me 
on, on, on where to aim and where to hit. And based upon where we would hit and where I was aiming, we would get points. And so that was, became quite competitive. Brother John, you know, I'm quite competitive. So come on, man, let's bring it on. So I've got my golf club. And I've got my stands right. I'm getting there. And I got my angle and I got my twist and all that. And I began to hit the ball. The first time I hit the ball, it just went just where it wasn't supposed to go. And, uh, and I don't want to embarrass myself, so I had to master this thing. So after a while, I'm starting to hit it where it's supposed to hit, and it's doing what it's supposed to do, and I'm getting points. And he said, there you go, Tom. Now you're on point. You're doing pretty good. And my points began to increase and increase, and I was right behind him. I said, this is all right now. So then I set up, and I reached back, and I hit the ball, and the ball went all the way to the end. And I thought I messed up because I thought I was supposed to hit these holes to get my point. And he said, no, Tom. He said, you did exceptionally well. He says, you hit it to the end. He said, that's over 200 and some points. He said, that's where you're supposed to be hitting it. I said, well, man, I didn't know that. I said, I've been aiming too low. <laughs> Preach past the sinners. <laughs> and I said, that's the problem with many of us is that we be aiming too low. We don't aim high enough, and we don't hit far enough, and we settle for a few points here and a few points there and a few points there. But if, if we set our aim, if we set our focus on that, amen, which is higher, amen, you'll we'll see greater results. I think that went over your head. You'll catch it on the way home. So think on things that are noble, amen. But not only that, it says whatever is right or whatever is just. Whatever is right or whatever is just refers to the duty and responsibility of all Christians to God and to each other. We have a responsibility not only to God, but we have a responsibility to one another. If you have noticed the cross, the cross is both uh, a vertical as well as a horizontal beam. Amen. It's two cross beams. It's a cross beam. Amen. Uh, and, 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 and I want to suggest to you that uh, the vertical reflects that which is us toward God. And the horizontal is representative of that which reflects us and our fellow man. So you can't have the cross unless you have the vertical and the horizontal. And the problem with many so-called Christians is they only focus on the vertical. And they totally forget about and forsake the horizontal. But you can't have the cross, which is the emblem of suffering and shame, and it is what Christ used to bring about a man honor because him dying on the cross, a man is what he used and or what was used uh, for his crucifixion. And we, my brothers and my sisters, are incomplete if we focus only on God and not focus on our brother man. Okay, y'all are feeling me. Let me give you some scripture for it. The Bible says, how can you say that you love God, who you've never seen, but you do not love your brother and your sister, who you see every day? It is about, it's about vertical as well as horizontal. You can't love fully and truly love God unless you love your brother and your sister. It is, listen, your greatest expression toward God uh, of love toward God is your expression of love toward your fellow man. Jesus says, listen, and it's not just loving those who love you. He said, it's easy to love those who love you. He says, what great thing is in that? He says, but love those who persecute you. Love those who hate on you. Love those who talk about you and call you everything but a child of God. Learn to love those who stab you in your back. Learn to pray for those who are considered or consider themselves your enemy. My brothers and my sisters, it's both vertical and it is horizontal. So the duty and responsibility of all Christians uh, is toward God and toward each other. It concerns giving God and men their due. Each of us has instilled um, in us from childhood a sense of what is right and what is just. Uh, my brothers and my sisters, you live your life focusing on that which is right and that which is just. 
He says, if you really want the peace of God, he says, meditate on these things. But not only that, whatever is pure. This refers not just to matters of sexual purity, though that is part of it, but it also to matters that demand a Christian response and or includes purity in motives and in actions, which also ends up being a reflection of your heart. Some people are not pure in heart. Some people just do things to be seen. Some people just do things because they want credit for it. Some people do things because they want people to honor them. Some people do things because they want their names in neon lights and or printed on some certificate or something or what have you. No, my brothers and my sisters, you ought to meditate on things that are pure and you ought to do it for the right reason. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. You ought to have a selfish motive. You ought to do it because God expects you to do it, and you ought to do it because you want to do it. Yes. Amen. Amen. So whatever is pure, but then not only is pure, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. Set your mind on things that elicit from others not bitter, bitterness and hostility, but admiration and affection. Things that are lovely. But then lastly, whatever is admirable and or a good report. In this context, admirable remain or refers to expressing what is kind and likely to win people and avoiding what is likely to give offense. Yeah. Things that, that are of good report. He says, these are the things that you ought to reflect upon. These are the things that your mind ought to be set on. He says to us, whatever the things are of good report and all that is just mentioned, he says, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Mm -hmm. This is the mindset, this is the disposition that we as children of God ought to have. Yeah. This is what we ought to embrace, this is what we ought to incorporate, this is what ought to be included in our everyday lives. So if you're not walking uh, along these lines, and if your mind is not focusing on these things, he says, you're not going to, it's not, first of all, not a reflection of maturity in Christ, but you cannot and will not walk in peace. I told you last week's message was what? L-I-P, live in peace. I told people, I told you that, that those who want to rest in peace can't rest in peace unless they learn to live in peace. And so when we learn to live in peace, we are incorporating these things into our everyday life. Amen. So this is what I want. It kind of reminds you of the fruit of the Spirit. Gentleness, kindness, and meekness, and, 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 and all that, and, and long-suffering. These are the things that we ought to incorporate. This, these are the things that ought to be part of our character. These ought to be characteristics of the child of the child of God. Amen. So you need to, and I need to, and we must meditate on these things. Get your mind focused on these things. So I encourage you as a child of God, this is something that you ought to print out. This is something you ought to put on five by seven cards or something and place them around your house and place them in your office or, or in your cubicle or whatever and focus. He says meditate on these things. This ought to be included and incorporated in your daily activity. Meditate on these things. But then secondly and lastly, he says, mimic these things. Uh, watch this. In verse 9, he says, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. These do. Amen. Did y'all hear that? These do. Paul says in another writing, he says, uh, follow me as I follow Christ. Mm -hmm. Paul says, I'm not new to this, I'm true to this, I'm committed to this. And he says, so the life that I live, I try my best to live a life that is reflective of a life that is pleasing unto God. And says, so when you look at me, you're going to see these things because I'm committing myself to these things. He says, I die daily. And because I die daily, and when I die daily, uh, these are the things that uh, begin to manifest and materialize in my life. He says, if you can follow me as I follow Christ, and he says, these things that I just uh, talked to you, and, and, and made reference to, he says, do these things. That's what Paul is saying to us today, church. He's saying, do these things. Incorporate and include these things. So not only, watch this, not only uh, are we to meditate on these things, he says, mimic these things. 
limit these things. Uh, these things I am modeling before you. Look at my life and see how I am modeling these things before you. That's why the children of God, you got to be careful what you say, what you do, and how you do it, and how you and, and who you do it in front of. That's right. Because there are those who are watching us as Christians. And I always got to remind myself of this, and I'm not always good at it. I don't always make the best choices. I don't always, <coughs> you know, demonstrate the best in speech and or in action. But I am at least mindful of it. And sometimes later on, I get home or get to wherever, and, and I'm convicted. I'm uh, trying to be careful how you say that because you know what? It has an impact upon people. And or um, someone may be led astray because of your freedom in Christ. What I tell people all the time, what I try to use as a scripture to give me some, some uh, uh, guidelines and parameters, when Paul says, don't allow your freedom in Christ to be a stumbling block for others. That's what he says. Don't allow your freedom of Christ to be a stumbling, stumbling block for others. So there are some things that you can legally do, if you will, legally in the legal sense, and legally meaning you have liberty to do certain things. Let me give you an example. If I decide to have a glass of wine, ain't nothing wrong with me having a glass of wine. I'm over 21, have been for many, many years now. Amen. And I'm not drinking wine in excess as to drunkenness and irresponsibility. And so if I decide to do that, there should be nothing wrong with that, right? But I've got sense enough to know that there are people that are watching me, and so it may not be in my best interest to have a glass of wine in front of everyone because everyone can't handle that liberty. So if my liberty in Christ becomes a stumbling block for you and to you, I will choose to not have that glass of wine because I don't want that to be the cause for you. Some people have, uh, have uh, uh, drinking problems. A person may be an alcoholic and or may be a babe in Christ. And so they may not be able to handle what you can handle. And so don't allow your freedom in Christ, your liberty in Christ, to be a stumbling block for them. So I try to use that to the best of my ability. So I'm not living a double life. I have no problem with having a glass of wine or having a cocktail. Amen. If you're of age and you're doing it responsibly. You know, if you can do it without it all together, do it without it all together. Because it's killing us. Amen. The stuff that's in alcohol or what have you. But my whole point is this. Is that if you are doing things responsibly, not a problem. But be mindful, people are watching. They're watching. And Paul says, because people are watching, he says, I got to be mindful of what I do. He says, so when you see me, he said, you can rest assured, you can mimic these things. You're going to see this included in my day to day? He says, mimic it. Are you hearing me on today? Yes, sir. All right. But then watch this. He says, and in modeling these things or mimicking these things and meditating on these things, he says, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, if you look back up in verse, uh, uh, in verse 6, it says, uh, and the peace of God, amen. Y'all see that? Yeah. The peace of God. If you look down at the end of verse 9, it says, and the God of peace. Watch this. So the results of this, if you, if you meditate on these things and you mimic these things, the results are the peace of God will keep you. The a peace, a, a peace of God, P-I-E-C-E -E of God will be given to you. And then the God of peace will be with you. Amen. 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 Did y'all get that? Amen. Shall I give it to you again? The peace, the P-E-A-C-E -E of God will keep you. He'll keep your mind. He'll keep your heart. Amen. And as a result, a peace, P-I-E-C-E -E of God will be given to you. A portion of God's peace will be given to you. But then the God of peace will be with you. And so, so that's what I wanted to tell you today is, is peace be with you. Peace will be with you if you meditate on these things. Peace will be with you if you mimic these things and or if these things are modeled through you. Peace be with you.
Thank you.